Hello everyone, I am Pastor Dave Karn, and welcome to Cross Keys Fellowship Online. We are glad you have chosen to tune in with us today. It's our prayer that you will worship with us and learn from God's Word. We believe the Bible is God's Word for us today. Its power molds and shapes us into the image of Christ while encouraging us and challenging us to go deeper in a relationship with Him. So join us now as we worship the Lord together. John chapter 3. Now, we've been in this series for the last several weeks called My Seven Chapters. And I've been giving you some of the um, passages of Scripture for me that have kind of helped me in my own walk with the Lord, helped me to grow in my walk with the Lord. And some of these passages of scripture you may have heard me preach before and we probably studied at some point together before but um, I just was kind of in, encouraged by a, an article that I had read several months ago um, about a friend of mine who who did a project like this and so I thought it would be great for you and so here's what I want you to think about and challenge you with this morning is have you thought of your seven chapters not verses Chapters. What are your seven chapters? What are the chapters of the scriptures that you have gone to over this, year, over this past few weeks that kind of uh, help define who you are as a believer, help to encourage you in your walk with the Lord? Um, have you done that? Have you taken the time to just kind of really think about it? Because hopefully it's challenged you a little bit to think about maybe seven chapters in the scriptures. Now I'm going to tell you that it's a little bit of a, it's a, little bit of a pain to do this. Um, and Christine will tell you, I think I've changed my verses multiple times before standing up here and sharing it with you because there are so many chapters in the Bible, and this is one of them. Uh, this was a passage that I was going to do a little bit later, uh, but um, nonetheless, here we are this morning. We want to talk about this idea of being born from above. In John chapter 3, you're probably familiar with this particular passage of Scripture, um, and we're going to look at it over, the next, over, these, over these next few minutes to think about what a true follower of Christ has been spiritually reborn. Do you realize and recognize that you cannot go to heaven without being born from above? You don't just walk into heaven. You don't just walk in there. You don't just do good things to get there. You have to be born from above. This is a concept that we struggle with, and it's a concept that we, we may not think too much about in our world today. But let me ask you a couple questions to begin with. What does it mean to be a Christian? Think about it for a moment, because this is a word that has been widely accepted. Anything's a Christian. Anybody's a Christian. If you're doing things that are morally right and acceptable and, and so on, you're a Christian. But what does it mean to be a Christian? The word really means to be a Christ follower, to be one who follows the Lord Jesus, the one who goes um, in, his, in his path. In Acts chapter 11, there was a great ministry happening in the city of Antioch. The church of believers had been spread out because of, of Stephen's martyr, martyrdom and Saul running around persecuting the church. And there was great things happening, and people were getting saved, and people were turning to the Lord. And the church in Jerusalem, which was kind of like the hub, sent Barnabas to Antioch to check out what was going on. And when Barnabas showed up, he checked out what was going on, and he affirmed that this thing was happening in their midst, that people were getting, to be, were, were getting saved, were coming to Christ. And the scriptures tell us that believers were first called Christians in this city. And they were called Christians in this city because God had turned them around, and they were living a life that pleased the Lord. You see, Christian today kind of gets a little bit uh, twisted. And anything, and anybody can be a Christian. But that doesn't get you to heaven. That doesn't get you into the kingdom of God. What does it mean to be born again? <clears throat> 
We probably don't talk about these terms too much, especially this idea of being born again. This is another idea. This is another concept in our world today where people who, have a, who go through a, a rough patch and, and their lives begin to turn around, sometimes they will say they have been born again. That doesn't necessarily mean they're a believer in Jesus. They've just been, their lives have turned. They've gotten a new start in life. They've experienced some kind of, of a refreshment in life, and so they're moving forward. But they, they, have, they have captured this term. They have, they have taken it almost captive to talk about what it means to be born again because this idea of being born again, as the title of this sermon suggests and says, it means to be born from above. That's what the word actually means. It means to be born from above. You've been born once, but now you need to be born again. You need to be born from above. And so this is that particular concept. Here, listen to this um, definition. A Christian is a person who is trusting Jesus Christ for their eternal salvation and is seeking to follow him in their daily life. To put it another way, a Christian is, a com is committed to Jesus as both their Savior and their Lord or Master. Billy Graham. Think about it. Trusting in Jesus Christ for your salvation, for your eternal salvation. But here's the kicker. In this, here's the kicker. It's the second word. You follow him in your daily life. I think that there are a lot of believers, born again people, who are just Christian by name, by name only, and they're not following him. They're not committed to him as Lord. Is Jesus Lord of your life? In order for him to be Lord of your life, you have to stop being boss. I have to stop being the boss. I have to stop being the one who's dictating my life. I have to surrender my life. I have to submit my life to the Lord. That's what it means to be a Christian. That's what it means to be born from above. And John chapter 3 gives us some of the details. We, we, kind of, we kind of go back to what this real meaning of born again means. What does it really look like? What does it really mean in our own lives we're going to go to the Gospel of John, and many, many of you have read the Gospel of John, and most of us sit here and say this is the fourth of the Gospels, and, and we go through the Gospel, and we recognize that this Gospel is a little bit different than the others. And some people try to hijack it and say oh, it's really not part of the Gospels, but it is. It still tells Jesus' story. It gives us the highlights, but John is writing for a very specific purpose. And what he says at the end of the book reveals that plan, that purpose. Jesus says this, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, the book of John. But these are written, what we have in the book of John, what you see in the book of John, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, that's the Messiah, the Son of God, the Anointed One, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you may have life in his name. This word for believe comes from the word for faith. Most of us in here would say we have a faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in Jesus Christ is the noun form of that. That's what you have. That's what you identify with. Believing means that you have taken that and are doing something with it. The word that's actually used here is the verb form of that word. And so we all know that a verb is an action. You can't just sit back and say, I'm a Christian, and not have any kind of produce, not have any production going on in our lives. And usually if we're kind of stagnant or stuck, it's because we are not following him. And we're not moving in the direction that he wants us to go in. We think we are, but it must challenge us. It must drive us further. It must remind us of who we are before we knew Jesus and who we are after we have known Christ personally. And the book of John brings in a series of signs. The series of signs, there are seven signs in the book of John. 
And each of those signs, the word for sign means to point somewhere. And so each of these signs are pointing us and pointing the readers to who Jesus is. The miracles that Jesus do, does when he walks on the earth is not a point and a, 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 an object of showing off, if you will. It's a sign. It points people, it points us. When we read, these, we read these gospel accounts, we see the power of God at work. And so John is writing this so that his audience will believe, so that you and I will believe, that we will put, put feet to our faith, that we will progress in a certain way. We will follow Jesus. We will be committed to him as Lord, and we will give him full reign of our lives. Well, John chapter 3, you know, has one of the greatest, most well-known verses of all time. John 3, 16, right? And we all know it. We probably all can say it from memory. At some point in your life, I'm assuming that you have heard this verse, but have you ever heard it in the context of John chapter 3? And this is what happens. Sometimes we pull out these verses and we study them and we memorize them and the power of God can be used to transform our lives. But then we try to step back and as we grow and mature, we look at those verses in a bigger picture. Because John chapter 3, 3, 3, John 3, 16 is captured in a greater story. It's not set in isolation by itself. And it comes as Jesus has an encounter at night. Look at the story it begins in John chapter 3, verse 1. It says this, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher from, come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. There, in these first few verses, we have the confrontation. Jesus has this confrontation with a man by the name of Nicodemus. And John gives us the details about this, and oftentimes we skip over this, right? And so we recognize the fact that Jesus and Nicodemus is a Pharisee. This is the most traditional uh, group of, uh, of Jewish religious people um, at, in Jesus' time. These are the guys that lived by the law. These are the guys that, that added to the law. These are the guys that, that knew the law and functioned. These, were, these would be your, your uh, fundamentalists, maybe your legalists of the day. These were the guys that knew the scriptures. They knew the Old Testament law. They knew the Torah. But we also learned in this passage that he's a ruler of the Jews, which means that this guy is one of the Sanhedrin. He is one of the 70 guys that, that are ruling over, over Israel, ruling over the Jewish people that consisted of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Sanhedrin means seven, so 70. So we have this idea of 70 men. He is one of those guys. This will be the group that sends Jesus to Pilate. This will be the group that condemns Jesus and calls him guilty of blasphemy. This is that group. And so we have this guy showing up at night. Now, many people think that he's afraid and he doesn't want people to know and so on and so forth. We, we don't have, there's no real recognition of that in this particular passage other than the fact that he comes to Jesus at night and has a conversation. It's the Jewish Passover in John chapter, in the previous verses tell us that it's Passover. And so there are many people in Jerusalem at this time. There are many people perhaps standing around because of some of the words that Jesus used here are plural in nature. So as he's talking to Nicodemus, he's talking to the group of people that may be standing around him at the time. And so this guy walks up to Jesus 
in the middle of the Passover, Passover, Jewish people traveled all over and they celebrated the Passover. And so here is Jesus at the Passover in Jerusalem and this guy, Nicodemus, a well-known person in the city, comes up to Jesus and says this, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. You notice the word signs. So Nicodemus comes up to Jesus in a respectful way. He recognizes Jesus as rabbi. He recognizes Jesus as a teacher. He recognizes Jesus as someone who come, has come from God. And he recognizes that all that Jesus is doing could not be done unless someone had come from God. And Nicodemus recognizes all of this. He's kind of like maybe priming the prompt, prompt or trying to start a conversation with Jesus. But in, in verse 3, Jesus kind of, kind of does an, a, a, goes in an entirely different direction. Notice what he says. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That has nothing to do with what Nicodemus had just said. But Jesus takes what Nicodemus says and goes in this direction. Because I think Jesus knows a little bit deeper into the heart of Nicodemus. I think Jesus knows a little bit about Nicodemus. I think Jesus knows and understands what's going on in the deep, deep down in Nicodemus' life. But he was a Pharisee. He was a ruler of the Jew. He, he was, you know, a descendant of, of, of Abraham. He was, he, was, he was one of those people. And so Jesus is now has turned this man's world on end. He says, unless you are born again, notice what he says, you cannot see the kingdom of God. This was a guy who believed he could see the kingdom of God, would be part of the kingdom of God. And what Jesus is saying, he's saying your religion means zip, zilch. In fact, there is no religion. You have to be born again. You have to be born from above, Jesus is saying. He, he goes in a completely, he redirects the entire discussion. And he goes right to the heart of what Nicodemus would have been thinking through. And he uses this word, born again. One person has said it this way about this particular term. He says, one of the greatest of all biblical terms has been stolen, emptied of its meaning, and dragged through the mire so that today, born again can mean almost anything or nothing. And Jesus is saying right here, this is what the heart of this word, this is the heart of this biblical word means. Unless you want to see the kingdom of God, unless you're going to be in the kingdom of God, unless you're going to be part of the kingdom of God, unless you're going to see for eternity who God is, you must be born again. And when I think about these verses in my own life, and I think about this as, a, as, a, as one of my seven, it reminds me who I am. Not because of what I do, but because of who Jesus is. It reminds me that I'm spiritually born new. I'm born again. Now I have this, this, this power to do something that I never had before. And the same is true for you. If you have a relationship with Christ. If you've been born from above. But see, Nicodemus is a smart dude. He's not a dummy. He knows exactly what's going on. And so he asks the logical question. The logical question here. He's a grown man. He's an adult man. Jesus says you have to be born again in order to have a relationship or see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus says in verse 4, how can this be? How can a man be born again when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb, right? Our logically thinking, right? This is what we would say. To be born again would mean that we would have to be literally born again. But Jesus isn't talking about something literally happening. He's talking about something spiritually happening. Right? All of us have been born once. We're all sitting here. Some of us are born again. We've been born a second time. You didn't go back into your mother's womb and come back out. You were changed. And being born again, I think, carries that idea of being changed. Your life has been 
change. It has been, has goes from, from, from being a sinner to being saved, to, from being a one who is an enemy of God to one who is a friend of God, to one who has been, been, been redeemed, bought back because of the work of Jesus. This is what Jesus is talking about. This is what's happening. And anytime Jesus uses the words truly, truly, this is kind of the, the biblical way of having us say, or listen, and say, pay attention to this. What I'm saying, is that you want to know what an absolute truth is, here it is. When Jesus says, truly, truly, there are no people in heaven who have not been born again. You can try, but you have to be born from above. You have to be spiritually born in order to see the kingdom of heaven. It doesn't matter how good you think you are. It doesn't matter how religious you think you are. There wasn't anybody more religious in Jerusalem that day than Nicodemus. And Jesus is telling Nicodemus, you're not going to see the kingdom of heaven because you're not born again. Talk about upsetting what you know. Talk about uncomfortable, right? That's the way God works. That's the way God's word works. It's alive, it says. It's active. It's sharp. And it pierces. I'm telling you, this was piercing to a man like Nicodemus. And it might be piercing to a person like you and me who thinks we're good and we're getting to heaven because we're good and because we're religious and because we go to church. And in the quietness of our minds, we hear Jesus say, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. But here's the, here's the amazing thing. This, this idea of born again is not, a con, is not an abstract concept. Jesus is saying it's possible to be born again. Otherwise, he wouldn't say this. Right? And so Jesus now explains to us what this idea means. He says in verse 6, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is born of spirit and spirit. He's saying this idea of water and the spirit. Jesus is, is following on the heels of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist came, and what did he do? He preached, and he taught this idea of repentance. And the idea of repentance that we needed to turn to from, from who we are and turn to God. And water baptism was a symbol of that. Let me remind you of this very clearly here this morning. Okay? No one is ever saved through baptism. You cannot be saved through baptism. Just because you were baptized doesn't mean you're going to heaven. If you were baptized as a baby, doesn't mean you're going to heaven. It is the outward symbol of being born again. It's the outward demonstration of being born again. And so the water part here is not birth. Well, you, ladies, you remember when you gave birth to your first child, what was the indicator that the baby was coming? The water broke. And as husbands, we knew that as soon as that water broke, you had to make it to the hospital fast because that baby was coming. There was no holding it back. And so maybe you were born in the back of a cab or in an Uber or wherever. You know, kids are born in Uber cars now. Maybe keep you from being an Uber driver, right? You never know who you're going to pick up. And so you have this idea. And so this idea, I think the idea of Jesus saying, you have to be born of water. You have, to be re you have to repent of your sin. You can't just come into glory. You can't just go into the kingdom of God. You have to repent of who you are and come and believe in Jesus Christ. And then you are saved. Then you are born from above. Then you are born again. You see, it's the repentance piece that people have a hard time with. Because in order to repent you have to recognize that you're a sinner. Wait, I don't want to do that. Right? Because in our minds, we think that we are good. 
Right? So as soon as somebody says, you need to repent from your sin. See, this is when people try to change the word sin. Or we try to water down the gospel so that we don't use the word sin because the word sin is highly offensive. But there are a lot of things in our culture that are highly offensive. And we have to deal with it. We have to move through it. And this is one of those elements. In order for us to be born again, in order for us to be born anew, we have to be born of the water, repentance, and the Spirit of God. You see, because when you repent, the Spirit of God, of God takes over and takes control of your life. In Romans chapter five, 8, this is what Jesus, or Paul says. He says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the, on the things of the Spirit. He says, For to set the mind on the things of the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the things of the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot, listen, cannot please God. Cannot please God. For those who are in the flesh. If you're in the flesh, it means you're devoid of the Spirit. And so if you don't have a relationship with Christ, you're in the flesh. And guess what? You cannot please God. And that's what he says. But then he says this, you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. Born from above, born again, spiritually reborn. This is what Jesus is talking about. This is what he's challenging this man to know. It's not about your religion. It's not about who you, who you ascribe to. It has nothing to do with Abraham. It has nothing to do with the law. It has nothing to do with any of that. Because all of Abraham, everything that Abraham was, everything that the law is, points to the Messiah. The, the seed that God promised to Abraham, yes, was fulfilled in Isaac. But that seed was greater than just Isaac. It also moved to the Messiah. Because guess what? Through that seed came the Messiah. And as we trust in Jesus, as we trust in Messiah, as we give our lives to him, the Spirit of God takes over. Therefore, we are born of water and the Spirit. And we are truly born again. And this is what t Jesus is teaching. And so the challenge becomes even greater here. The challenge we see in verses 9 to 15 now drives this, this thing. And so Nicodemus struggles in this moment with this idea, of, with this concept of, being, of unbelief. We're not going to believe. Nicodemus says in verse 9, he says, how can these things be? How can these things be? And Jesus answered him. He's listened to what he says. Are you a teacher of Israel? And yet you do not understand these things? He said, wait a minute, aren't you a spiritual guy? People know you. People know who you are. And you still don't get it? Verse 11, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. Jesus is challenging the unbelief. Unbelief is driven bl by the blindness. If you don't believe, you have not given your life, if you tr haven't trusted in Christ as your Savior, if you, don't, if you don't believe that God, that the same God who worked in your past can work in your present and is working in your future, if you don't believe in these things, then, you're, then you, uh, you unbelieve. You're, you live in a state of unbelief. And Satan is, this is Satan's tool in our lives so that we would not believe. In fact, 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says this, in their cases, the God of this world, that Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is, in the, who is the image of God. Satan is working overtime to blind the eyes, to blind our eyes, to keep it away. And Jesus is saying, there's an answer to this. There's an answer to this unbelief. He says in verse, in verse 12, 
He says, if I had told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? If I'm telling you something from the earth and you don't believe what I'm saying, how in the world are you going to ever believe something spiritual? And then Jesus says this, no one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses was lifted up, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. It's powerful to see what Jesus says here. No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven. Jesus, in this verse, speaks of his divinity, speaks of his origin, speaks of where he comes from. That's powerful. But then Jesus goes on and says in verse 14, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And what Jesus does, Jesus is, is, is absolutely knows what is going on here. And so he knows that this man, Nicodemus, knows the Old Testament. And so what does Jesus do? Jesus goes right into the Old Testament, right into the heart of this, right into the wheelhouse of this guy. And he brings out a story. He brings out a story that happened in the book of Numbers. As the children of Israel were coming out, they started to complain against God and Moses. And that's what the text says in verse 5. And the spe people spoke against God and against Moses. He, they said this, Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord, now listen, this really should try to this really challenges us a little bit when we start to uh, counteract God's plan, right? For me, this is a little bit of a warning against my incessant complaining. Verse 6, Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many of the people of Israel died. I think if God sent a little bit more of those fiery serpents, maybe we would complain less. That is if you survive. But these people are complaining. And God sends the fiery, fiery serpents. And it says this in verse 7, it says, and, and the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned. We have, for, we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away this serpent from us. So Moses prayed to the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent, set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent, set it on a pole, and if the, ser and if the serpent bit anyone, he would look at that bronze serpent and live. Moses makes a serpent. God says, Make a serpent, make a, a fiery serpent, put it on a pole, stick it on a stick, and put it in the ground. And if anybody is ever bitten by one of these fiery serpents that come from God, all they need to do is look at the serpent. It's very interesting to me that God chooses to use a serpent. Because how do you know a serpent? Who, who do you know is, is a serpent? Satan took over a serpent in the Garden of Eden. And this is the same person now. This is the same thing that God uses for a time. For a time. This is what Jesus is talking about. And so that serpent in Jesus' text is now metaphoric to refer to sin. In, the, in Numbers, it brought redemption, it brought salvation, it brought healing, it brought, it brought this ability to, to, to be healed. It's interesting how that serpent, in the months to come, become an idol. They don't destroy it. They keep using it until God says, destroy it. And so this is that picture. So Jesus being lifted up. How is Jesus going to be lifted up? He's going to be lifted up when he's put on the cross. And anybody who looks to Jesus has eternal life and lives. See, that's John 3.15. But we don't know John 3.15 or John 3.17. All we know is John 3.16. 
And Jesus continues, and now he explains this in a greater detail. And this is the verse that we know. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And a lot of times what we do is we latch on to this idea of love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. I like how it translates only son and not only begotten son. Because when it's only begotten son, then Jesus comes from somebody. But Jesus doesn't come from somebody. He's always existed. And so a better translation is actually one and only son. But to me, you know, we can latch on to this love. We, we damage to God. We know God loves us because of these verses and because God has shown it to us. But why does he do this? Why does he send Jesus? So that you and I will not perish. We don't think of that word as being the key word in this verse. But all this happens so that you and I don't perish, but that we can live forever when we look to Jesus. You see, verse 17 says this, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that in order that the world might be saved through him. As believers, we need to walk around trying to, to, trying to share the truth of the gospel, seasoned with grace and communicating truth. I think that we come into the world condemning everybody. Jesus did not come in the world to tell you you're going to hell. Because you're already going. You know that, right? You're already going there. You were on a one-way you had a one-way ticket straight into hell. But God gave his son so that we wouldn't go to hell and perish, but have everlasting life. But we have to believe in Jesus. We have to make a decision. We have to do what God is calling us to do. We have to live by these verses. God didn't come here to condemn us. Jesus didn't come here to condemn us. He says in verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. You are condemned. When I read these verses and I think about my own seven chapters and my own walk and my own life, I am not who I am without Jesus. You are not who you are without Jesus. You can't do it. I can't do it. But because he loved us, because God loved us, I have the ability now to live forever. But I have to believe. I got to do something. I got to do something with what I'm hearing. Because if I don't do anything with what I'm hearing, and I think that I'm just this or that or the other thing, I'm condemned. I'm condemned. Verse 19 says, this is the judgment that has, this, the light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that in many, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. God has come so that the, the light of the world is here. The light of the world is shining. You and I, as we have a relationship with the Lord, shine in the darkness. If we're not shining in the darkness, we're living in the dark. We're doing the things of the dark. 1 John says this, This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light. And in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in the darkness, listen to this, we lie and do not practice the truth. You cannot be walking in the darkness and walking with God. It doesn't work. It doesn't happen. Because there is no darkness in God at all. But we've been taken out of that darkness. We've been exposed to the light. We now respond to the light. We have to live for the light. That's why we have to follow Jesus. And I think that as believers, that's where we get challenged. We don't want to follow him. We want to do what we think is right. We are all in that boat. We all struggle with that. 
But John says if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Not one another, you and I, one another between us and God. We have fellowship with God. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's fitting that we are doing communion here right now. Because John 3.16 comes alive in communion. Because John 3.16 reminds us of the great love that God has for us. The great love that God has transformed us while we were sinners. We never had to do anything. We never had to clean up our lives before we came to Christ. He became sin for us to take away our sin so that we could live forever. If you don't have a little handy dandy little cup put your hand up and the guys in the back will come around and, and give it to you and as we come to this point before I finish what I want to say I think it's fitting right now to think about am I in the dark or am I in the light am I walking in the darkness but say I have a relationship with God am I walking am I living this life you see, I think as believers, this is the way we walk. We either walk with God, one step in front of the other. But I wonder how many of us as believers are walking like this. When you think about it, think about it if we walk like this. It would look a little weird, wouldn't it? And that's what we do. I think as believers, we, we go between the light and the dark. The light and the dark. Instead of in the light. And even Nicodemus was that. The Apostle Paul told the church in Corinth, who was really messed up, he corrected their practice of communion. And it's like I told you, around here, we don't do communion on a set time. Christine has to always remind me when communion is. It was supposed to be last week. But now I know why it was for the day. And if you don't see the connection. And you're missing the Spirit's work in this moment. We're never going to be perfect. We're never going to be perfect on this side of glory. And God doesn't demand that perfection this side of glory. One day you will be. One day I will be. Everybody's looking forward and everybody wants the Lord to return now. And they want the Lord to return now so we get out of the mess we're in. And that's always great. But I want to be there forever. That's just, the, that's just the beginning of forever. Do you ever think about how long forever is? It makes your head hurt. But then I think about John 3.16, and I think about this passage of Scripture, and it reminds me of who I am. Because of what he's done. His sin, my sin, not his, my sin, brought him here. Nicodemus wasn't able to live perfectly according to the law, no matter how much he tried. And he needed a Savior. He needed a Messiah. He needed to be spiritually reborn. Just like you and I. Jesus is in Jerusalem when this conversation happens, and it's Passover. And on that last Passover, Jesus celebrated and introduced what we celebrate right now. And he told his disciples, he said, guys, this, this bread represents my body. 
Because in a few hours, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give my life for you. I'm going to die on the cross. And every time you do this, every time you celebrate this, every time you get people together and you celebrate, you rem remember me until I come back. And that is what we do here. And the Apostle Paul says, you know what, when you come into this time, you take a moment because you're not perfect. We all sin. We all fall short. We all come up short. We, we never can never do anything that will perfectly please God in, in every way, but our faith can please God. And when we miss and we step and we start walking in that darkness, we got to recognize it. we got to stop straddling. There are no believing straddlers. You're either walking with God or you're not walking with God. And Jesus and the Apostle Paul tells us that when we take part of the communion, when we take part of the Lord's Supper, take a moment to examine yourself. And for a quick moment, you know where you are with God. You know where you're wrong. You know what you've been doing. You know that when you think you're right, you're wrong. And no matter how right you might think, you're still wrong because you might be telling 50 people. Recognize where you're wrong. And before you partake this morning, trust God to forgive you. Confess your sin. If you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to forgive you, to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That's a prayer that you and I as believers claim. That's not a salvation verse. That is a how to stay in fellowship with God verse. Take a moment to examine your own hearts. Lord Jesus, you were born in a humble manger at the exact time from eternity past to be my refuge, to be my Savior, to be our Savior. We are humbled by that. Father, you have saved many of us in this room. We have been born again we are spiritually reborn. But Lord, the flesh can be so strong. May we know that the spirit is stronger. As a church, unite us together. Bring us together so that we can be a power in our community. Be reminded of your great work. In Jesus' name. Jesus took that bread and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples. He said, do this in remembrance of me. The bread represents his humanity. The bread represents the reason why he came as a believer, as a, as a person, as a human being, in the form of like, the likeness of men. But as every covenant in the Old Testament was sealed by blood, was, sac was a sacrificial animal, a perfect lamb, so too the new covenant that you and I experience right now was sealed by the blood of a perfect animal or a perfect man in the Lamb of God. And Jesus, when he took that fourth cup and that Passover Seder, that cup of, of <clears throat> sanctification, he took that cup and he said, guys, he said, this cup represents the new covenant. This represents the blood of the new covenant that was shed for you. For without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And Jesus said, every time you do this, do this in remembrance of me. John 3 reminds us of this great power. And as we think about this for this morning as I finish, there are two things that come to mind as I read this and reread this passage of Scripture and I challenge you with this morning. The first one is relationship. Christianity may be a religion, 
It's a relationship. It's a relationship you have with Almighty God. In order for us to have a relationship with God, in order for us to see God, we need to repent of our sin. We need to believe that Jesus died on the cross, and we must make him Lord of our lives. That's how we need to operate. That's how we need to function. It reminds us of this great relationship that we have. But it also reminds me that I'm empowered. I'm empowered. Because before this moment of salvation, I did not have the Spirit of God. You did not have the Spirit of God. But as you become a believer, now the Spirit of God lives in you so that you and I don't have to straddle, so that you and I don't have to make a choice, so that you and I can live according to the Spirit when we set our minds according to the Spirit. As Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, he says, I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of your flesh. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit, not straddling, not wobbling. You keep in step with the Spirit of God. You walk in the Spirit of God, and you will not gratify the flesh because we've been born anew, because we've been born from above. We need to listen to what Jesus said to that religious leader. Nicodemus is an interesting character because in chapter 7, Nicodemus will come to Jesus' defense and will support Jesus and give Jesus an opportunity to respond as he determines with 70 other men what to do with Jesus. And it's the same Nicodemus who will join up with Joseph of Arimathea who was also a member of the Sanhedrin and will bury Jesus after he dies. Maybe they were hiding, but at the end they became known as Christ followers. You and I must be born again, born from above, in order to see the kingdom of God. Will you be there? Have you trusted in him? Do you believe in him? Make him Lord of your life. God, we thank you for this very powerful chapter, this very significant understanding of what it means to be born again. Lord, help us to take our relationship with you serious. Help us to take it out into the streets. Help us to, to live as you have called us to live. Help us to walk by the Spirit. Live by the Spirit. And Lord, when we're out of fellowship with you, May your spirit make that known to us. Lord, it's because we are born from above and we have a spiritual side to us now. We now have entry into glory. And one day, we will see your kingdom. And we long for that day. But until then, help us to take one step at a time and live for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you for watching today. We believe the Holy Spirit works in everybody's life in very different ways. If you already have a relationship with the Lord, our prayer is that you will grow deeper in your walk with Him. But if you've never trusted in Jesus as your personal Savior, we believe that today could be that day of salvation. Admit to God that you're a sinner, believe that Jesus died on the cross, and rose from the dead, giving you the hope of eternal life, and confess Him as Lord of your life, following Him from this day forward. To believe in Jesus requires a very simple prayer of faith, one that you can pray with me right now. Dear Lord, I know that I am a sinner. I ask for your forgiveness. I believe Jesus Christ is your Son. I believe that He died for my sin and that you raised Him to life. I want to trust Jesus as my Savior and follow Him as Lord from this day forward. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. We would love to hear about any decision the Lord led you to make, so please take a moment to email us. Again, thank you for watching today, and may God continue to bless your life.